Praise God. Nobody else is going to shine your light. Jesus said, we are called as lights into a dark world. I'm going to let my little light shine. Amen. Take your Bibles. Remain standing for a few more moments and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. And we're going to read from verses 34 to 36. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Over the last uh, couple of weeks in preaching, I have felt a sense of urgency in, in everything that I have preached. And once again, I have the same feeling again as God has led me in this direction to share what I will share today. But Luke chapter 21 and verse 34 to 36 is where we're going to start this morning. Has everyone got it in their Bibles? It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke chapter 21 verse 34 and take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life everyone say cares of this life that's that's a that's a lot of things isn't it it mentions two specific things but then it it says the cares of this life says lest at any time your hearts be overcharged or overcome with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life and so that day that rapture speaking of and so that day would come upon us or come upon you unawares for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth then some wisdom for us some instruction watch you therefore everybody say watch and pray always everyone say pray watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man the scripture tells us that there is a chance that we could be overcome with the cares of this life and that the day of the rapture may capture us unawares and to in order so that we are not unaware and not caught unawares when Jesus comes back, we are told to watch. I remember when we would say grace, my, my mom and dad would always, if I had my eyes open, they would say, shut your eyes when you pray. It's a good thing to do. But I remember being cheeky enough to say, the Bible just says watch and pray, mom. I was really watching that. My sister didn't steal my food. But we're told so that we are not caught unawares that we are to watch and pray and I simply want to speak on those two words watch and pray watch and pray Lord Jesus we just thank you for your word today we thank you Lord for this church we thank you Lord that we can take your word Lord we thank you Lord that your presence is here Lord we thank you Lord your spirit is here that comforts us even in this time and guides us into all truth Lord as the preaching of your word comes forth Lord God turn me into a microphone from heaven Lord God that people here would not hear the words or the voice of me Lord God but they would hear you speaking to them directly Lord I offer myself as a vessel to be used of you today in encouraging and exhorting your church we pray this all in Jesus name and everybody say amen you may be seated watch you therefore and pray always watch and pray I'm gonna start by making a statement today that it doesn't matter what else you accomplish in life it doesn't matter what you accomplish in life I want to tell you that the most important thing that matters in this life is that you are ready when Jesus comes back you may accomplish some things in life you may make some wonderful contributions to our society to our church to our world you may raise a good family you you may have a ministry but there is nothing more important than being ready when Jesus comes back and the church ought to say amen I stand and I make those statements profoundly on the Word of God because in Matthew chapter 16 verse 26 it says what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose 
his own soul. That's a pretty clear statement to me. You can gain the whole world, every dollar in the world, every possession in the world, every piece of real estate. If you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul, you are not profited. It has profited you nothing. If you get to that great white throne judgment and you've got all the possessions and all the money, you've got land here and there and you drive a nice car, let me tell you, it all amounts to nothing if you're not ready to go to heaven. Amen? And so we need to be ready for heaven going. We, we need to be ready for when Jesus comes back. Now, some of us are young and we say, you know what, Pastor, I don't really have to worry. I, I'm, I'm not near the end of my life yet. I'm still healthy. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not old yet. Um, and so I don't really have to worry. But let me tell you, that's not the only way you're going to get to heaven. We always think that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know the, the undertaker's not here yet. I'm not, I have not ready to die yet. I'm not sick. I'm of good health. But let me tell you, we're not just talking about the undertaker. We're not just talking about getting to heaven via death. You know, many of us, we've got to be ready because Jesus is coming. He's the upper taker as well. He says that there are going to be people that are caught unawares in those last days. They are not going to be ready for the second coming of Jesus because they have been caught up in the cares of the world. They have placed their value on the wrong things. They have pursued the wrong things. So I'm not just talking about the undertaker today because Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to catch my church away. We've got to be ready to meet Jesus in the air. Somebody say amen. amen. And so prophecy is very popular amongst Christians. When you get a bunch of Christians together, they love to talk about prophecy and what's going to happen in the last days and, and this and that and timelines and all these things we like to discuss, the signs of the times, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, you won't read in the Bible anywhere where God says, always be figuring, always be debating. He doesn't say, try to figure out the time that I'm going to come. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, discuss with theologians. He doesn't say, do research to try and figure out when I'm coming. In fact, Jesus says, no man knows the day nor the hour that I'm going to come. So you must live your life in a state of readiness. We've got to be ready. This is no time in these last days to be caught up with the cares of the world because you can gain the whole world, but if you lose your own soul, it profits you nothing. Watch therefore. Matthew 24 verse 42 says the words of Jesus, For you know not the hour your Lord doth come, but know this, but if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. So the illustration is there. And then Jesus tells us, therefore be ye also ready. Jesus says, I'm coming back. You don't know the day nor the hour, but be ready for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. When you least expect it, the Son of Man cometh. I believe that every single Christian, that every person will hear the warning sound of the trump of the Lord. There will be a warnings that will go out. And this is another one of those warnings. And I want to tell you, the Bible says to watch, to watch the seasons that are in the world, of course, but to watch what comes from the pulpit. In Amos chapter 3, I want to point your attention to a, a book of the Bible that we don't often take our text from. But we read here in Amos chapter 3 verse 6, if you can turn there, it will be on the screen, that God never sends judgment on any society until He first reveals it to the prophets what He plans to do. And you'll see it over and over through the Word of God, that warnings are sounded by men and women of God, that warnings are sounded of judgment. Amos 3 verse 6 and 7 says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be an evil in the city that, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth 
his secret unto his servants, the prophets. God will send warning after warning over the pulpits of churches that he is coming back. It says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so take it again as another warning over this sacred desk today that God is telling us that we've got to be ready. We've got to watch. We've got to pray. We've got to make sure we're not caught up with the cares of this world and that we are ready when Jesus comes back for His church. God said, He said, I will speak to you. I will warn you. I will blow the trumpet through the man of God. I will warn you. And I want to tell you today, as your pastor, I can't save you from natural disasters. No, I can't do that. But my preaching, even the foolishness of my preaching, maybe for some, the foolishness of my preaching may save your soul. I can't save you from coronavirus. But let me tell you, my preaching may just save your soul. The preaching that comes over this holy desk is what can save your soul. So tune your ear to the pulpit. Tune your ear to the Word of God and say, God, I want to hear your warnings. I want to be ready when you come back. Pastor... Why, why are you so noisy in the pulpit? And if you know me, I'm not a noisy guy. I've got a loud voice, but I'm not really a noisy guy. Why, why are you so passionate in the pulpit? Why, why can't the pastor just give me the answer? Many people, they come to my, my office for counseling, and I know deep down they just want me to give them the answer they want to hear. I learned a long time ago that it doesn't matter about my opinions. It matters only what thus saith the Lord. And I'm not about to go and endorse somebody just because they want me to give an answer they want to hear. My dad used to tell me, he'd say, never get your fingerprints on somebody else's murder weapon. I can only tell you what the Word of God says. There are scriptures that I, as your pastor, have to deal with that you don't. That's just a reality. There are scriptures as a man of God that I have to deal with that you don't. Ezekiel chapter 33 says this. I'm going to read the whole portion and there's going to be one of the scriptures is going to be on the screen. If you could pop it up on that fallback screen. Son of man, Ezekiel 33 verse 2 to 9 says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if they take a watchman, okay, from their lands, pastors, a watchman. If the, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet. The watchman, when they see danger coming, they are to blow the trumpet and to warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not the warning, even though the warning has been sounded, those who don't take the warning... His blood shall be upon him. Your blood is upon yourself. You were warned. Your blood is upon you. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But, and this is the scriptures I need to deal with as as a pastor, as a watchman. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, if the, if the pastor, the watchman does not blow the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Every time I come to this pulpit, I approach it with reverence and fear because I am responsible for the flock that God has put in my care. If the watchman does not blow the trumpet, your blood will be on my hands. You may have never ever read that scripture before. If I blow the trumpet and you do nothing, the blood's on your hands. But if I do not blow the trumpet and people do not hear, then your blood 
is on my hands. And so that means for me as a pastor that waking up on a Sunday morning is not just like any old Sunday morning. That as a pastor, I cannot just come to this pulpit with, with pretty little sermons and, and politically correct sermons and easy listening. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to leave this place feeling victorious. But more than anything else, I want to make sure you leave this place and know that we've got to be ready when Jesus comes back. And so I must stand on the wall as a watchman and declare for everyone to hear, for those under the sound of my voice, to those that are watching via way of the streaming, for those that are going to listen to this podcast, I've got to stand on the wall and I've got to declare, we've got to watch and we've got to be praying because Jesus is coming back for His church. (laughs) And I, I want to be saved more than I want to be comfortable. Anybody want to be saved more than you want to be comfortable? You, you, you go to your doctor and you've got, a, you've got a really, really bad disease. He's going to say, well, it's going to take a little bit of, you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable for a couple of weeks, but you're going to, you're going to get better. You're going to say, no problems, doc. Give it to me. I'll take a little bit of un- uncomfortableness. I'll, I'll take some, uh, I'll, I'll take being co- uncomfortable for a little while because I know that in my uncomfort, I'm going to get better. And the doctor says, well, you can be better. You're going to die in one month, but I'm going to give you one week of of medication. There's going to be some side effects. It's not going to be very nice, but you're going to be dead in a month if you take this. You're going to be uncomfortable for a week, but in a month, you're going to be better. Oh, no, doc. (laughs) Is there another way we can do this? I don't want to die. I know I've only got a month to live, but is there any way that I I could just do this whole thing just in comfort? I don't want to be put out. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Let me tell you, as a, as a pastor, I would rather you be saved than to be comfortable. And that's why I'm preaching this message today. I would rather come to church. And I, many times I've sat there as my dad has preached in this church and other men of God have preached. I've sat there and it felt like my seat was on fire. It felt like somebody at the end of the row had plugged me in to the electronic, to the electronic circuits in this place, into electricity. I felt that buzz as, as I was sitting on that chair. I was like, you know what? I'm not in the right place with God. I got to be ready when Jesus comes. And so I'd rather you come to church and, and, and feel conviction and, and, and find a place of repentance than to just walk out and say, well, pastor, that was a feel good message. There's going to be times when we walk out of here and we feel good. There's going to come times when we walk out of here and say, you know what? I heard the watchman's trumpet again. Yeah, it's a place where you'll find hope here. It's a place where you can be encouraged. It's a place where you can find fellowship. It's a place where you can find friendship. But Calvary Chapel is also a place that is focused on pulling you and pulling your family towards righteousness that is focused on pulling you and your family that we've got to live a righteous life I, I want to put a, a hunger and a thirst in you that you will hunger and thirst after righteousness to help get you saved because that is the only thing that matters in this whole world you can gain the whole world but if you lose your own soul it profits you nothing in Psalm chapter 23 we love that portion of scripture how many people like Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd. We love that. And David makes a statement in verse 4. He says, Thy rod and thy staff. He's talking to the Lord. He says, Your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, many people believe that the rod and the staff were two things. Some people believe that the rod and the staff were just two opposite ends of the same thing. That the rod was the straight end. And that the staff or the crook was the curly end. But David said these words. And I was never able to say these words about the rod. My parents gave me the rod. They were old school. Everyone was old school back then. But I was never able to say exactly, well, maybe I can say it now, but I wasn't able to say it then. I never turned to my dad and said, Dad, the rod gives me comfort. Do it again, please. I was never able to say that. But now I can say it. The fact that my parents disciplined me and gave me the rod that I'm not as bad as I could have been. (laughs) David said this of the Lord. He said, your rod and your staff is a comfort to me. Now, the rod is a defensive thing. 
the rod was used to, to beat off predators. When the predators would come near the sheep, the, the shepherd would take the rod and just give them a whack, keep them away. The rod, when uh, even sometimes the rod would be used to correct a sheep. The rod. But David said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so the rod defends us, protects us. It's a comfort to us. And he said, also the staff, which is that crook, the shepherd's crook, comforts us. Now that, that, that shepherd's crook, that hook, it wasn't used on the bears or the lions or the foxes or the dingoes that would try to come and get the sheep. That, that shepherd's crook was used for correcting the sheep. It would hook them around the neck and just guide them in the right way. David said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It wasn't enough to just protect the sheep from the lions and the bears. David was comforted in the fact that God would come sometimes, Troy, that God would come sometimes and just hook him around the neck and pull him back into the right direction. Maybe you've been to church sometimes and you felt like the Word of God was just hooking you around the neck and just getting you back on the right path. Sometimes it might even be a little bit offensive. How, how dare God do that to me? Uh, uh, you know, the Bible says in, in a man's eyes, his, his ways are always right. But God says, hey, you got it wrong. And he comes through that shepherd's crook and he hooks us around the net and he puts us back on the right path. And just like we praise God when we feel encouraged and when we feel victorious, we ought to praise God and say, God, I'm thankful I came to church and you put that old shepherd's crook around my neck and you yank me back on the right path. We drive home, they say, how was church? You say, it was very comforting because God took time to get me back on the right path. And David said, thy staff, your rod and your staff are a comfort to me. He, he did not say, Lord, I want healing, you know, when I'm sick, but please don't tell me what I've, wanted, what I've got to do. He didn't say, I want your blessings when, when I need some more money in the bank account. No, he didn't say, I want, I want healing, I want blessings, but don't correct me. He said, I want your blessings, I want your protection, but I also want your, the comfort of your correction. And so, I believe God would correct us today. The devil's not stupid. He's not trying to get us to make a choice between heaven or hell. He's not, he knows we're smarter than that. If every single one of us were given the choice between heaven and hell, we'd all choose heaven. And so that's not his tactic. He's not coming out to the world. He's not coming to Christians and the church and saying, okay, you got two choices, heaven or hell. No, he knows that we are smarter than that. What the devil would try to make us do or to cause us to do is to divert, listen to me carefully, to divert our attention away from eternal things and to get our attention on temporal things. To divert our attention away from heavenly things and to focus on earthly things. And so there was some famous thieves once, they wanted to rob a jewelry store. There was lots of gold, there were necklaces, there was jewelry, all of this, this gold worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they wanted to go in and rob it. But you know what? Every time they turned up at the jewelry store, there was someone standing there with a sawn off shotgun. There was, there was, um, there were alarms everywhere. There were security guards everywhere. There were bollards out the front so they couldn't do a ram raid. They didn't know what to do. How can we go and steal all the gold from this jeweler? They were smart thieves, if there is such a thing. So they decided that they would just go in day after day and they would just peruse the jewelry that was in the cabinet. And what they did while the shop attendant wasn't looking, uh, Jordan, is they would go and they'd just start changing the price tags. To take the $10 price tag off the $10 necklace and they would put it on the $10,000 ring. And they would take the $10,000 price tag and they would put it on the $10 necklace. And they begin to change all of the price tags of the things that were in the jewelry store. They went in there and they changed the price tags. Let me tell you, that is exactly the way the devil is working today. He's coming and making you to not value the things that are valuable. 
He's come in and, 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 and causing us to get caught up with things that don't even matter. Earthly things consumed with the cares of this world. He comes in. He's not trying to get you to choose between heaven or hell. He knows we're smarter than that. But He comes in. He tries to tempt you to value the things that are temporal. And so some of us, we're trading away things that are worth $10,000 for 10. And we're paying $10,000 for something that's only worth $10. Changing the price tags. Brothers and sisters, don't be caught up with the cares of this world. Sin will follow a temporal mind. If you're focused on only the temporary things, sin will follow. A temporal mind is a mind that is led by the flesh. And if we have a fleshly mind, we cannot uh, fulfill the purpose of Jesus Christ. And so I've come to remind the church today that we need to loosen our grip. Everyone say loosen. You know, I heard a preacher say, some people are not going to get to heaven because when the rapture happens, they're going to be holding on so tight to their things, they're not going to be able to get off the earth. Holding on tight to the things of this world. But as a church, brothers and sisters, we need to loosen our grip on the things of this world. Our treasure should be laid up in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt. We need to remember, like the old song says, that we are pilgrims, we are strangers, that this world is not our home, that we are just a passing through. We need to focus on the coming of the Lord more than we are focusing on our retirement. We need to focus on the coming of the Lord more than our next holiday. And I love holidays. We need to focus on the coming of the Lord more than our next payday don't get caught up with temporal things I tell you we're living for eternity and what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul just imagine my wife and I and the kids we're going to go for a holiday to Bateman's Bay what a beautiful place to have a holiday so we we rent a motel room for a week we're going to have a lovely holiday. So I've rented the motel room for a week, Brother Gian. So I decide I'm going to go and get a loan from the bank because we want to make sure we have a good holiday. It's only for a week, but we're going to go and buy a brand new bed. I'm going to put that bed in the motel room. I'm going to go and buy a big buffet to put all of our crockery. I'm going to buy some lovely crockery, crockery, is that how you say it? And cutlery, some knives and forks and some lovely plates. And we're going to put that in the motel room as well. We're going to go and we're going to buy a big, big screen, much bigger than the one they provide in the motel room, but a lovely big flat screen and a lovely big solid timber table. We're going to, we're going to deck that motel room out with everything we can. We're going to borrow whatever we can. We're going to spend all of our savings and make sure that we've got that in that motel room. We're going to be there for a week. We're going to make sure as comfortable as possible. Sounds foolish, doesn't it? You say, Pastor, that is absolute foolishness. Why would you do such a thing? At the end of the week, you're going to have to hand the keys back and it's all gone. <laughs> Maybe somebody's just starting to get it now. That's the way some of us live. We're only here for a short time. We're filling up that, that little motel room with everything we can. We're, we're spending all of our money on things that we're just going to be handing the keys back. We're just strangers and pilgrims. We're just here. We're like, we're renting. This is like the motel room that we're just here for a short time. This world is not our home. Listen, some of us need to remember that we've got to lay up our treasures in heaven. I've used this illustration before. I want to use it again. But you know, life is like a game of Monopoly. Monopoly has a lot of good memories. How many people played Monopoly when you were young? Anybody played Monopoly before? I remember playing with my grandmother. She was the loveliest lady. She wasn't so good playing Monopoly though. When she started losing, she was known to flip the board. My lovely, my dad's mother. You know, my dad's a quiet man. So is my grandmother. But when you play Monopoly, when she gets in debt and she realizes the bank account's emptying out. <laughs> but life is like Monopoly. We're born. We get our little piece. Welcome to the game of life, the world. And today I'm the dog. It says, Go. And so we're born, 
we start making our way around the monopoly board you know the community chest you you go and you get some little things in life from sale of stock you get 45 bucks wow take that life is good god is good keep moving around what's today gonna hold six one two three four whoa well i think i need to purchase some land i'm gonna purchase euston road i'm gonna gonna get myself an investment property let's keep going on with life and we go around and and we start getting some rental income and well we're getting there you know life is really progressing quite nicely now and so what does today hold all three let's go oh i didn't get in jail (laughs) lucky but I'm going to buy Paul Mall. I'm going to put two houses on that. You see, I'm just going to build my investment portfolio because I want to make sure I'm as comfortable as possible. I'm going to go get a mortgage. I'm going to get a mortgage. And uh, that's all right because I'm going to get more income and start stuffing my pockets full. I got more money. Great. All right. I'm richer than the Joneses now. That's good. And we get another chance. Oh, it says, take a walk on the board. Wow, God is good. We're on our way to Mayfair. Let's go. We get to have a nice holiday on a Mayfair. While we're there having a holiday, I might just buy myself another house. I'm going to buy a nice little hotel there at Mayfair. I want to, you know, if I go back to Mayfair, it was a nice place. I'd like to have somewhere to live. And you know what? You might make a bit of cash on Airbnb as well. And so take another mortgage out. What is life going to hold for us today? Oh, six. That's good. Go pass, go. Wow, bonus, $200. Collect $200 as you pass, go. Uh Uh-oh, income tax. Well, ah. I won't write it down. Keep going. Hopefully you pay your taxes. Two, let's buy another investment property. That's good. I'm going to get a car as well. Oh, man. Man, you know all these investment properties? (sighs) Wow, I'm stuffing my pockets full of money. Look at all the cash I got. You know what? I think it's time to upgrade the car. You know, the Toyota, they're good cars, but they don't have the sort of badge I want. I want to go for one of them with the three, the three things, you know, the Mercedes. That looks better to me. With nice big rims. And imagine what the people at church are going to think. <laughs> they don't need to know that I've, I've got a big loan for it, but... You know, anyway, the investment properties are still going well. I'm still stacking my... my <laughs> and then, as life begins to close its curtains, we get to the end of our life and we've accumulated cash and investments and cars. We've been here, there, and everywhere. We all start the same way. We're all born into this world the same way. Our lives take different paths as we go throughout life we all take a very very different paths in this world some of us we all make different decisions we all have different amounts of money we all go to different places we all have different share portfolios we all have different housing investment portfolios we all go to different places for holidays but there's one other thing we have in common it's just like the game of monopoly doesn't matter how much money you got doesn't matter how much investment properties you've got at the end of the day it all just goes back in the box and that's one thing we have in common listen some boxes might be fancier than other people's boxes but it's just a box and eventually that box is going to be burned or it's going to be put in the ground either way whether you pay the big bucks to get put in the ground or whether you pay the discounted rate and get your body cremated you can't escape the fact that you're going to end up as dust and when it's all said and done brothers and sisters when the game of life is up you've accumulated all your temporal things you've created your comforts you've got your spa and your sauna go on a holiday and I don't I don't think any of those things are bad. They're all good, but keep them in perspective. Because in the end, they're all temporal. And they all go back into the box. They all go back into the box. And that is the end. You know, there's going to come a day when some of us will be wheeled to the front of this church. And after all you've done, it goes back into the box. And so the devil's not silly enough to make you choose between heaven or hell. 
He would try to get you to invest all your time and to be concerned with the cares of the world, even though it's going to all pass away. Only what you do for God will last. Watch and pray, brothers and sisters. Watch and pray. Because we don't want to be caught unawares. I want to take you to a scripture that had a new meaning to me today, uh, this week as I was preparing. Matthew chapter 13, verse 7. And I'm getting ready to finish. Matthew 13, verse 7. And some... It's talking about the, the sower throwing the seed. And some fell among the thorns... And the thorns sprung up and choked them. Choked. Everyone say choked. The thorns, the, the seed landed amongst the thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked that seed. I want to warn you today about the consequences of an overcrowded life. Some of our lives are so crowded with things that it doesn't matter what is preached from this pulpit. It doesn't matter what God speaks to you in prayer. Your life is so crowded that in just the moment of time, that seed is choked. Now, streamlining, I used to work as a consultant with, with, a, with a company. We used to go into businesses and streamline business processes. And, and we used to go in and we'd, we'd look at a business process and we would streamline it. We'd, we would try to remove any activity that's not profitable. Anything that isn't contributing towards the bottom line. Anything that is a waste of time. We would try to streamline it and remove all the things that aren't profitable. I want to say to you today that some of us need to streamline our spiritual lives. We need to go through and find all the things that are consuming all of our time. Find the things that are worthless and not valuable and they're choking our life. We need to go through and get rid of everything that has no importance because I want to be ready when Jesus comes back. And these are the consequences of a crowded life. I believe God wants to warn us what we are really battling with right now. I know some of us would rather battle demons and devils because we can just re rebuke them and, and he's defeated anyway. But this is a more sinister enemy. The more sinister way the devil is coming towards us. He's trying to get us to value things that are worthless. To crowd our life out. Devil's no challenge for a born again believer. The devil's no challenge for a, a, a new a, a, the name of Jesus. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. But there is an enemy we must conquer, church, and it's the thorns. Everybody say the thorns. It's easy to live for God, and, and this is where some of us are at. I'm going to make this statement very carefully. It's easy to live for God when you've got nothing. But when you get stuff, everybody say stuff. It starts to get in the way. The rich young ruler, he wanted eternal life. The challenge was, you have to leave your stuff. He walked away grieved because he had so much stuff. Our challenge, church, is not that we don't have things. Our challenge is not the absence of things now. Our challenge is the abundance of things that we've got. The thorns, and they're literally choking the life out of us. Our challenge is not the absence of opportunity. Once upon a time, we didn't have opportunity, but now we've got so much opportunity. We are wasting our lives on things that aren't important. Some of us have been choked by the thorns, the stuff, the stuff. You see, there was nothing wrong with the seed, the seed was fine. There was nothing wrong with the soil. The soil was fine. The problem was it was planted in an overcrowded place. The crowds. The woman with the issue of blood had a problem with the crowd. She had to push through the crowd to get to Jesus. Some of us need to deal with the crowdedness of our lives. Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because of the crowd. He climbed a tree. The innkeeper missed out on being a part of the amazing redemption story because why? The inn was too crowded. 
Four friends brought their man, their friend who had the poles. He couldn't get into the house because of the crowd. They had to let him down through the roof because of the crowd. Let me tell you, the devil wants to crowd your life with so much stuff so there's no room for God anymore. I'm sorry, church. I'm warning. I'm sounding the trumpet. Don't let the things of, don't let the things of God distract you from the God of the things. Don't let the things of God distract you from the God of the things. Some of us are blessed. We are blessed because we are experiencing the blessing of God. But sometimes the blessings of God are what is distracting us from the God of the blessings. Some of us can stand in this place and say, I just want to thank God for His goodness. I want to thank God for His provision. I want to thank God for the comforts that I have. And we ought to do that. But never let it distract us from the God of all those things that we are blessed with. The consequences of an overcrowded life. Watch and pray, church. Watch and pray. Listen to the watchman on the wall. Love the rod and the staff. Watch out for overcrowding. Don't let your stuff hinder your walk with God. Focus on the eternal, not the temporal. Brothers and sisters, all these years, I've heard it preached. I've sung songs about heaven. I've thought about heaven. I've preached about heaven. I've dreamed about heaven. Let me tell you, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I want this church to be ready and I'm here to sound the trumpet. I'm here to sound, the, to be the watchman on the wall and tell you today, brothers and sisters, we must watch and pray. If the musicians could come. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 and 2 says, Now we beseech you therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, don't be shaken in mind and don't be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. There is no reason to fear. Just make sure you're ready. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 to 14. And you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation. That actually says, For ethnicity shall rise against ethnicity, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold I believe it means that some people that love God are going to love their possessions more and he that endures to the end the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come Luke 21 verse 25 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then they shall see the son of man everybody say praise the Lord they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with great power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, church, when these things begin to pass, look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh everybody stand in this place right now we can lift up our heads we can look up for then our redemption draweth nigh I want to tell you that signs are like labor pains we are seeing signs in this world right now I want to tell you that everything we're seeing in this world right now is telling us that Jesus is coming back soon and the, the pains in childbirth they become more frequent and more intense yes because the baby is getting ready to come. I want to tell you that there needs to be an urgency, church. There needs to be an urgency. Everyone say urgency. Uh, I fear that the church has lost its sense of urgency. One of the scriptures says, There shall be two grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Let's not forget 
It's all about our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who's coming. First Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which shall remain and alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Everybody say, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, church. Come on. It's not about the here and now. It's about eternity. Right now, we need to lift up our eyes from looking at the things of this world. Lift up your heads and look because the trump of God is there and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're going to go and meet the Lord in the air. I come to comfort you today with these words. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. No matter what it costs you today, We've got to be ready for the rapture, brothers and sisters. We've got to be ready for the second coming. We've got to be ready when Jesus comes back. Let's lift our hands all across this place right now. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. We praise you, God. We worship you, Jesus. Nobody like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Watch and pray. That's my word today. Watch and pray that you may be ready when Jesus comes back. Watch out for the overcrowdedness in your life. Watch out for the distractions of the temporal things. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This whole place ought to be turned into a prayer room right now. If you want to come to this altar and pray, we're going to take some time to pray. Watch and pray for you don't know the hour in which your Lord doth come. Church, we've got to be ready. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs you. Don't let the devil come and change the price tags. Remember when it's all said and done, it's, it's all just put back in the box. You're pursuing the things of this world, but they are worth nothing. I want to be ready when Jesus comes back. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, church.